It's a great honor and pleasure to be here with you. Um, I had done this uh, several years ago in the tiny little room on sitting on the floor with a few cushions and about four people. And that was kind of what I was expecting. Um, I don't know if any of you want to move down a little closer, um, just to have a little more intimate and uh, closer crowd. And I hope you can all hear me. Is that all right? I'm going to, I'm going to begin. I'm going to, to be um, talking a little bit ab about the prayer and um, sort of what it is, what it involves, what it kind of requires of you to do it. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about what it has done for me in my life, um, and then we'll have a little chance to practice a few things and, and try it out a little bit. So that'll be the, the format of my talk. I'm going to begin with a quote that I think is kind of the key, it's the, kind of the central truth of what I'm trying to talk about and trying to say. Uh, it's by E.B. Pusey, um, and he's really one of my favorite, a uh, little bit older, not exactly contemporary uh, writers. He says, not man's manifold labors, but his manifold cares hinder the presence of God. Whatsoever thou doest, hush thyself to thine own feverish vanities and busy thoughts and cares. In silence, seek thy father's face, and the light of his countenance will stream down upon thee. He will make a secret cell in thine heart, and when thou enterest there, thou shalt find him. And if thou hast found him there, all around shall reflect him, all shall speak to him, and he will speak through all. Outwardly thou mayest be doing the work of thy calling. Inwardly, if thou commend thy work to God, thou mayest be with him in the third heaven. I wanted to pause for a minute and ask if the lights could come up a little bit um, so I could see. I'd, I'd much rather be able to see all of you. Can we turn, turn the lights up a little bit? Um, a little more? <laughs> Sorry, I'd much rather be able to see you than just black. Thank you. Um, and this is a quote from Meister Eckhart. The quieter the mind, the more powerful, the worthier, the deeper, the more telling and perfect the prayer is. And this from St. Augustine. The whole business of this life is to restore to health the eye of the heart whereby God may be seen. Uh, the spiritual masters of the Orthodox Church have always emphasized the importance of the prayer of the heart. They see the consequence of the fall as the separation of the mind and the heart. The mind is for thinking, it's for truth, the heart is for love. Prayer unites the mind and the heart. Practicing the prayer is about finding the unity of the whole being again. Through the use of silence and a mantra, or a mantra is a short repetitive phrase. And I want to say that um, I, I was sort of told to do this, to cover all of this from kind of the beginning, assuming some people don't know much about it, and also being aware that some people probably have done this for years and know a great deal about the prayer. So if I'm repeating things that you already know, please forgive me. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to cover everything. Uh, a mantra is just a short repetitive phrase. The surface, um, for the surface areas of the mind <clears throat> to become in tune with deep peacefulness of our being. <clears throat> Excuse me. We leave behind all the passing images and thoughts that preoccupy us daily and learn to rest in the infinity of God. Meditative prayer, as the Jesus prayer is, helps us pay attention to the presence within us. We become conscious of the nature of Christ within us and understand that our, our calling is to abide with God in our depths. So what is the Jesus Prayer? There are uh, several forms of it. it. The longest form is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. This can be shortened to, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. It can be shortened even more to, Lord, have mercy. And it can be simply the name of Jesus. And what is most uh, commonly done is whatever length you choose to do, we, we breathe in the first half 
and you breathe out the second half, whatever length it is that you do. The name of Jesus is very, very important because in the name itself, the name carries everything about Jesus. It carries who he is, what he taught, what his life was. It implies God the Father. So when you say the name of Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, you are actually saying everything. And it's one of the reasons that since I started doing this prayer, I'm, I'm always deeply bothered when I hear people take the name in vain, when they use it as a, a kind of a curse or an expression, because that's what you, you, the name carries the essence of Jesus. Our task is to find our way back to our center where wholeness and harmony are realized. We leave behind all the false images of ourselves, such as what we think we are. And Merton has talked a lot about this as the false self. And you will find this when you start to do this prayer um, and you come into this silence, suddenly this self, this ego just pops right up and it's like, oh, I'm not sure I wanna be sitting here this long. Um, I have to do this, I have to make this phone call. This is what I'm gonna make for dinner. This is what I have to, and you'll find that this, this conglomeration of thoughts and images of ourselves that we carry around in our conscious mind is suddenly you know, front and center and wants to be in control. Um, we try to silence and get away from the daily thoughts by simply letting them slip by. Um, that's what the mantra is for, is to kind of take you away from all that and bring you into a more controlled um, silence in your mind. When you have all these thoughts and they're coming, when you're sitting there, what you have to do is just let them go. They, uh, there's an image that's like a boat on a river. You simply watch them, you sit quietly and you just watch them go. Oh, that's that thought about what I have to do. That's that thought about this person I had an argument with or whatever it is, you just let it go and watch it go, go down. Don't try to stop it, don't try to change it, you can't. Uh, you just have to observe, let it, just let it be an observation. The Indian mystic uh, Sri Ramakrishna described the mind as like monkeys swinging from tree to tree, all full of chattering and movement. When we begin to meditate, we realize how much the mind is like that, and that underneath there exists a quieter place um, of being. What we, we need this simple phrase, this mantra, to keep us away from all these thoughts, to keep us in a present moment, and not what we're going to be doing um, in the next hour or the next week. Um, but this is where um, I find that there is, what's hard about doing this meditation is precisely at this point, you've, you've sat yourself down, we'll go over some of the things about how, how you do this, but you sit down, you get your mantra, you know what you're gonna say, and you start saying it. And then comes something that's almost like a resistance. You just think, what am I gonna do for 20 minutes? Or what am I gonna do for half an hour, whatever your time is that you've set for this, and you start feeling this kind of discomfort and you wanna almost run away from it. Um, and this is what, uh, this is where the humility comes in. The, the biggest comment I get back when I tell people that Jesus' prayer is, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. A lot of people say, I don't like that sinner part. I don't wanna to have to say that. I don't wanna be groveling you know, on the ground saying I'm a, I'm a sinner. What it really, I, and I, I think maybe I've thought that in the beginning too, but I've come to see that the humility part of saying something like that, recognizing that you are not in control, this humility is very, very crucial to the prayer. It's very important. And that's why it's still there. That's why they haven't taken it out. This outer self, this false self, this, um, this has to go, and this is painful, and, um, and, and difficult as you, as you find you do this over time. It's what we call poverty or emptiness. And that's why I think this part of the phrase in the prayer is so important. And I just try to tell people it's not because it's not you're such an, an awful person or they're gonna lock you in jail or anything. It's, it's that this humility part of it is really essential. Um, as we persevere, we discover that the poverty of the mantra leads us to a really radical simplicity uh, that makes courage possible. For we are capable of greater courage than we imagine. But the meditation is the prayer of faith because we have to leave ourselves behind 
before the other appears. And that's the key. You have to go through this dropping yourself, letting go, before you can come into more the presence of the other. And that takes also a leap of faith because sometimes you do the prayer, you don't always think it's going to be there. It isn't always there. You come into the prayer with many moods. Sometimes you're in a great place and sometimes you're not. You just still do it. But you don't always have, you, you, there's, there's a, a leap of faith that something is going to be there with you. The essence of poverty is this risk of uh, annihilation. To see ourselves, we must first look to another, for the way to selfhood is the way of otherness. Uh, it's this continuous state of liberty and perpetual renewal that completely passing into the other. There's no other way than through humility. We are entering a void in which we are unmade. There's a kind of undoing of yourself that you have to allow to happen. We cannot remain the person we thought we were. Uh, we are not destroyed, but awakened to the eternally fresh source of our being. As Jesus said, you have to lose your life to find it. Now, the difference between meditation and prayer, I think, is just that. Meditation, as I understand it, is a kind of calming. It's a, um, you use a mantra. You find a way to center yourself. But the difference with the Jesus prayer is then pointing towards Jesus, towards the reality of Jesus, and actually losing yourself into that presence. That's sort of the, how it gets carried from meditation into more, into the prayer. The surface areas of the mind are now in tune with the deep peacefulness at the core of our being. The same harmonic sounds throughout our being. In this state, we pass beyond thought, imagination, and all images. We simply rest with the reality, the realized presence, of himself, of God himself dwelling in our hearts. I started doing this, um, I started doing this 40 years ago. Um, and I th in, in the program it says something like, I came to this because of Sufis. I actually was living in Egypt and I experienced Sufis doing this prayer of invocation using the name of Allah. And I was so taken with this, and it must have been very important for me in my life to do this because I, I began a search to find this in the Christian religion. Um, my, uh, I, uh, about 30, I, I guess I've been doing this about 20 years. My daughter died. 11 years later, my husband died. I was left with two small children. Um, I had I was a painter. I didn't really have an income. Uh, we had, were living at the Groton School, so I didn't have a house. He was the employee. A year later, my older son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, and my life was very difficult. And I would wake up, sort of coming out of sleep, I would wake up in that region between sleep and consciousness with the worst feeling, day after day, year after year, just thinking, I don't know how I'm going to do it. I don't know how I'm going to carry on. And it was only getting up, doing this prayer, and finishing this, 20 minutes finishing this, that I actually had the courage to get up and get through a day. This prayer, this prayer really kind of has been the strength of my life. And it's been over 40 years. It doesn't happen quickly. You don't, you don't do it for two days and think, um, you know, something's going to happen. I think I actually started this way back when I started 40 years ago. I had the hopes that I was going to have a visitation. I thought, you know, I'd have image, you know, things coming to me. I didn't know what I thought, but I, I thought I was going to have all kinds of stuff happen to me. Nothing happened to me. And in fact, that's part of the humility. That's part of what you, that was my journey. I had to become quite humble in accepting that the prayer was about God and not about me. Uh, and that was a journey in itself. What did happen, and, and it was maybe eight or ten years ago, I think I, after doing this for 30 years, I sort of turned around at one moment, you know, wasn't just one day, but at, at some point I turned around and I realized that this huge change had happened, not outwardly in images or visitations or miracles or anything like that, but that the prayer had gone from my my mind into my heart. 
and it lives in my heart. And there's a presence and a spirit in my heart that is just a jewel. And I knew that. I knew that the change had happened. I, I don't, I can't tell you how, but it did. And it continues to live there. It is really the jewel of my life. So um, I, that, that can happen, but it takes, it takes time and it takes patience. So how do you begin? Um, you begin by finding, uh, well, choosing what your mantra is. My mantra is actually, I, I use Yezu Mariam. And I speak it out loud because being out loud keeps me focused. Um, I have never been able to find a star. It's, I went, when we lived in Vienna and I learned to, to do, I, when I learned to write all the icons, I was looking for someone who would teach me all the, the breathing. And I found a Russian priest who, who was um, teaching the painting class. And he said, well, you'll have to go into deepest, darkest Russia to find someone to teach you how to do that breathing. I know they do it in Mount Athos. My spiritual director has always told me to speak it out loud. It keeps me focused and it keeps me in, in the moment. You find it, uh, a ch you can sit on the floor or you find a chair and I find it very helpful to align yourself. Keep, get yourself centered and aligned. Feet on the fl a floor. I use um, prayer beads. I have a couple different kinds here, but I use beads just because beads are, again, they're tangible. They keep you, again, right in the moment. And um, they also, I don't have to count. I don't use a clock, although there are times when I have used a, ki a kitchen timer or something like that. It's very helpful because you don't have to worry about, if, you're on, if you have 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes at night, you've got to get up, you've got to get to work, a timer is helpful. You don't have to worry about it. You can let yourself go. Same thing with the beads. You can say it's this many times through for this, um, and, and that's, that's very helpful. Uh, you close your eyes and you begin the repetitions. I did give you all a sheet of paper, and these are prayers from the Orthodox Church. I find they are wonderful prayers, and I use them to begin with because it's hard to just jump right into this. These prayers, you, um, and anything you want to do, any, any way that you want to center yourself and begin, I find these prayers just a lovely way to enter in. Um, in fact, I have, they're more than this, but I, this, these prayers, especially the one, the one I love the most is the, um, O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art everywhere present and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us of all impurity and save our souls, O good one. So that's a, that's an, a wonderful way to kind of just begin and get yourself into the the mood. You can, uh, you can breathe half of it in and half of it out if you're going to say it silently, or you can speak it out loud. There are lots of things that people do to um, keep, uh, again, to keep in the moment. Uh, there are, you can chant it, you can sing it, you can, um, you can use bodily movements. If you're, if you're kneeling or sitting on the floor, there are ways that you can bow. You can use uh, different kinds of bodily movements. There are also themes, and you can have some kind of a theme. I, I have several themes that I use on different daily bases uh, to, that go. What you'll discover is when you do this, you've got, your, you've got the prayer going up here, and the mind is a tricky thing because underneath, it's like you've got a sub-level of your mind that's doing something else, and that's where it's often thinking about other things. And if you have a theme or something that, you, that is important to you, some, some spiritual thing that you can carry with you, you can kind of go back and forth between the two. As your mind is repeating this, you can be also focusing on this theme. Some people have the image of Christ like above, sort of out there, center of their, of their visual mind. Um, there are lots of ways that you can deal with um, distraction. We must set aside all discursive operations of the intellect and turn the very apex of our soul to God and be entirely transformed by him. We need to trust him implicitly. Um, and this, um, we were talking this morning and I was, I was talking about the um, Merton quote of uh, the protecting nearness. 
And I had found this quote, actually, listening to audio tapes, this was years ago, of Merton giving a class at Gethsemane on Sufism. And he, was, and he mentioned this wonderful quote uh, by Rilke about the protecting, that God is not something that's way up there, far away from us, judging us, but God is a protecting nearness that will not permit final destruction. Um, there's an awful lot of trust that goes into this. You have to trust God. You trust that you're handing over yourself to him. You're handing over the keys to him, and, and that's the beginning of the dialogue. Without the trust, I think the dialogue just really can't, um, can't take place. To trust another is to renounce self and place your, your center of gravity in the other. This is the experience of transcendence itself. We receive more than we could ever have asked for um, or ever dared to want. Set your mind on God's kingdom before everything else and all the rest will come to you as well. That's from Matthew. Most importantly, um, keep the same words. Don't change your mantra day to day. Find something you're going you're gonna to say and stay with it. Um, I mean, obviously, in the beginning, you can try a few things out. But that's very important that everything you do, you keep the same. And that will help you settle in um, and, and get rid of the distractions and things you're wor worried about. Oh, I would, the other thing I was going to mention, I have a dog, and, and my dog has a big golden retriever, and he loves to come in when I sit down and get ready to do the prayer. It's like he knows it's time that he thinks he can get patted. So there's all that, that stuff that happens around you, too. I remember when I had small children, um, my, uh, the spiritual director I had bef before, um, Ramakumar Swami, used to say to me, as a mother, your first obligation is to your children. You, if you're praying, you've got to get up take care of your children. So I always did that. But other distractions, cars, you know, trucks beeping, whatever happens, you have to just let it go. Don't try to block things out, but just you, you come into this state where things, you just allow, allow things to be, and you keep your own kind of separateness from that. But keep things the same. Uh, we pass from loneliness to communion, living out of the center. We pass, uh, the, and what you'll find is that the fruits of the spirit, the things that come out of this oh, year after year, the patience, the sense of things that, the ways that you'll find, just as I found that the prayer had moved from my mind to my heart, you kind of look back at yourself in a way and say, oh, I'm, I'm more patient than I used to be. You'll find that these things come. You will be changed. And that brings me sort of to my last point, is that all of this is for you but it's not just for you. It's also to bring back into the world what you have become and how you've changed. Um, one of my most favorite people is uh, Father Richard Rohr, who has this Center for Action and Contemplation in Albuquerque. And it's not an accident that he hooks action with contemplation, because contemplation, the point of it is to then be transformed and then bring back the good back into the world. The prayer of the Spirit of Jesus wells up in our hearts, floods our hearts and our souls, and overflows with this amazing gift we have been given by Jesus sending us his Spirit. But he does not force it on us. It is for us to recognize and accept, and this we do not by being clever or self-analytical, but by being silent, by being simple. The gift is already given we have only to open our hearts to the, the infinite generosity. And I'd like to just repeat that first paragraph that I wrote, um, because I do think everything is contained in that first quote. Not man's manifold labors, but, but his manifold cares hinder the presence of God. Whatsoever thou doest, hush thyself to thine own feverish vanities and busy thoughts and cares. In silence, seek thy father's face, and the light of his countenance will stream down upon thee. He will make a secret cell in thine heart, and when thou enterest there, thou shalt find him. And if, he has, if thou hast found him there, all around shall reflect him. All shall speak to him, and he will speak through all. Outwardly thou mayest be doing the work of thy calling, 
Inwardly, if thou commend thy work to God, thou mayest be with him in the third heaven. So um, I, would, I would like now to do, uh, um, w the first is an exercise, just a quick exercise for about a minute. And what you're, what you're gonna be doing, I mean, I'm sure many of you already know how to do this, but you'll just be breathing in and out and just focus on the breath going out of your, in your nose and out your nose. That's all you're gonna be doing just for a minute. It'll show you how centered you can be just by doing something like that. And then we'll stop for a few minutes and then we'll do a five minute of the Jesus prayer. If you wanna pick whatever version of it you would like to do, we'll do it for five minutes um, and then we'll have some, some time for some questions. So, um, all right, we'll start and do just for a minute of the breathing. Were you able to see how that kind of f focuses you right into that sort of place right in the front of your mind and keep you right there? Um, if, you can, if you do the prayer silently, you can try to focus on your breathing is one way that you can try to stay, stay present. Um, do you, can, you, can you pick some version? Do you want me to read the versions of the, of the prayer? Pardon me? Yes. Okay. Um, the longest version is Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Next version is, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. You can say, Lord, have mercy. You can use the name of Jesus. So let's do for five minutes, let's do that kind of a prayer. If you want to get, your, um, get yourself kind of aligned and centered um, and relax, take deep breath, and I will time for uh, five minutes.
I, I should also have mentioned, I've just completely forgot to mention that the icons, if you look at this one, and, and they are a little bit squished vertically on the screen, um, icons are a beautiful way to meditate also, to sit in front and do the prayers. And this one in particular, uh, this is the Trinity, you'll see that there's a circle that really inscribes all of the, um, of the three. This is Jesus in the middle. Uh, these are the three angels appearing to Abraham at Mamre, but it's also the Trinity, Jesus in the middle, um, the, the, ho the Holy Spirit on the right, and God the Father on the left. And there is a circle that inscribes that, that and you enter in through the square in the table. That's, you enter in that way, and you go into that rhythm, and you allow yourself in that. Most of the icons have some kind of rhythmic, beautiful um, feeling of rhythm that allows you in, in a prayer to go in and stay in there. Um, and in this, Jesus also points down to the, the chalice, has the head of a calf, the sacrificial calf, because he is the sacrificial lamb. So I could, I could tell you all kinds of things about the icons as well, but they are a beautiful way to, uh, to also to use in prayer and in meditation. Um, so I guess we have a few minutes to open up for questions or reflections, if anybody has anything they would like to say. And could we have a little more light? Because I, I really still can't see anybody very well. Yeah, that's great. Um, does anyone have anything they would like to um, ask or add? Hi, thank you very much. Um, this has been so inspirational to me, something I've been doing for a while, but not sure I was on the right path. Mm -hmm. But uh, could you tell us more about the themes that you have sort of uh, come up with to sort of uh, carry you through different days? Uh, well, they, ha they have to do with, uh, there are things that I've gotten from my, um, from my spiritual director, and they have to do with um, kind of death of the ego and um, this is the best thing I could be doing uh, in, 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 with my whole day. This is the absolute best thing I could be doing. Um, sometimes it has to do with just um, peace, like, like centering yourself like a, a water that has no ripples in it, like a mirror. They're just things like that. And they just keep them in, underneath so that it, that also can bring you back. You know, when you find yourself wandering, can, can bring you back to, to the focus of the prayer. Hello, thank you. It's kind of a personal question, but I hope other people can um, experience a good answer. So um, in my experience with either the Jesus prayer or my um, meditative prayer life, sometimes I feel so close to Jesus Christ, like he's my friend. And then there are months where I feel separated. And I just want to say, is that normal? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not an expert, but I would say yes. That I think there, there's such a, that's why you really can't, you can't judge or do this by results or you know, feelings or whatever. It's, it's a discipline that needs to be done day by day on a, on a daily basis, preferably at much the same time of day, once or twice a day, and you, you cannot, it's like the feelings are, can be here and there and all over the place, and you can't really uh, judge your um, progress even on feeling. Um, and there are times where you feel very far away, nothing's happening. I've also learned that those are not necessary. How we, how we perceive that and judge that is not really accurate. We don't, all, we don't really always know what's going on. Um, that's, why I would, that's why I think you see things in retrospect. You, that's the one place maybe you do have a clearer vision. You look back on things and you say, ah, I see, I have gone from here to here. But at the moment, you can't judge uh, how things are going. Yeah. I have found this prayer very useful to me, and uh, particularly as I meditate on the words, Lord Jesus and Christ, Son of God, each one of these conjures up a different dimension of Jesus. 
to me, and, and I, I just try and find each one of those words meaningful as I address the rest of the prayer to him. Because they each have slightly different yes. um, aspects of him. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hi. Yes. Um, thank you for uh, lifting up the Eastern Church, the Eastern Christian Church to us this morning. It sounds like you've had some extensive experience with that, and I think in terms of spirituality, the Western Church has a lot to learn from the Eastern Church. I encountered this prayer through the way of the pilgrim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, did you do the same, or can you share a little of that? with us? You mean how I came to it? Yeah, or? how'd you come to it? Um, well, I, the way of the, I, read, I read those both. Um, I, from, from being in Cairo and from, from observing Sufis who had this uh, amazing prayer that I could tell did something to them that my Western church wasn't doing for me. And, I, that's, and, and so I started just on the journey trying to find, uh, we moved to England, we were in Oxford, and I, that's where I first uh, heard uh, Father Callistus Ware speak. He was a young man then. This was in 1980. Um, and I got the, the Way of the Pilgrim, the books, and, uh, st and started doing this by myself. And it wasn't, but it wasn't until I went to Vienna and um, found this Russian priest that, that I did the, the icon uh, painting with that I really, um, I, I, mean, I just kept searching. I kept searching all over trying to find somebody to, to do this because the, the I think some uh, it is helpful if you can have someone to direct you and help you you don't have to I think things may be slower if you don't or you just you just falter you don't have the encouragement I think you need somebody to help you just keep say just keep going keep going because a lot of times as you say the the benefits the rewards don't seem to be there and you think why am I doing this is this a waste of time is anybody there you know it's it there is a lot of that and you just have to have some way to to be encouraged and keep going. And I would say it is it is a discipline. You have to just keep doing it. Um, but the way of the pilgrim, the the wonderful thing about the way of the pilgrim is that he's he talks about how it went. Again, it went from his mind to his heart, and that's what I first read many years before I actually experienced it myself um, doing that. Um, so, but it, the way of the pilgrim doesn't tell you too much about how to do it. Nothing does, really. Uh, but but if you, then you are enabled to pray unceasingly. Yes, yes. And, and that, and, and I think, you know, that idea about bringing it back into your life, it becomes, that's what, that's what when he says it's your, um, where is it when he says, uh, outwardly you may be doing the work of thy calling. Whatever you're doing outwardly, it's in there. It's, it's with you all the time. It's the jewel that's in your heart all the time. And whether you're saying the words or not, the prayer's there. And that, that's the great, I, you know, I, I didn't have a vision of Christ. I didn't, n nothing like that ever happened. But what did finally happen was of so much greater treasure, you know, to me. <coughs> You may have already answered this question, but my question was, was in the direction of your relationship with your spiritual director, and maybe more broadly, if, if through that relationship you've come up with a kind of um, uh, sense, I mean, obviously it's a very personal relationship on the one hand, I assume, but, um, but if there's uh, you know, a way that you might uh, uh, put out to, to us uh, how we might look for the right kind of relationship with respect to spiritual direction. Does that make any sense? It's a hard one. I don't know how to tell you to find a spiritual director. I mean, that's a really hard one. Um, I prayed for years for a spiritual director. Maybe that's the best thing I can say is you just got to pray for one and, and hope one will be given to you in some way. Uh, Raman Kumar Swami was the most wonderful man. Um, I was with him for 18 years. And he went from being uh, the most erudite, sending me these packets of things with all the stuff about the name of Jesus and rosaries and all this stuff. And I, and I used to look at him and think, oh my gosh, because I had two young children at the time. How am I going to digest all this and do this? 
to, he went through the death of my daughter, I was with, and then the death of my husband, and then my son was his diabetes, and it got to the point where after 18 years I would call him and I would say, you know, this is what's happened now, and after a while, all he ever said to me was, there'd be this long silence, and he'd say, well, he said, you're just gonna have to trust God. And by the end, that's all he ever said to me, because I don't think he, he didn't have anything. There wasn't anything else he could say. But that's, that was everything. That, and that's what, that's what he would just counsel me. And in the end, he didn't ask me to trust him. He kept pointing me to trust God. And when he died, you know, I, I was able to, to let him go because he had pointed me towards trusting God. But that's what, that's what you have to do when you do the prayers. And that's what the prayer does. The prayer links you to God in a way through trust and through kind of giving, giving up yourself to, you, you then, you have this direct link. You are, you are with God and, and you ha he is your spiritual director then. But as far as helping you find one, I, I, I don't know, it's very hard. Uh, does that answer anything? Thank you, no, very helpful, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just, just Two things. Um, one is, is the beauty of it being rooted in the scriptures in the sense of Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. To speak the name of God, you are enveloped in that presence. That's why they never spoke the name of God except, you know, high priest, high holy days in the temple. Because of that understanding that, that to speak, you were in it. The other thing is, um, I'm going to try to do this. Years ago, a Trappist monk up at um, Our Lady of Guadalupe, I think it's called, up in Oregon, the Trappist monastery up there taught me a little chant of the Jesus prayer. Oh, Jesus Christ, you are the Son of God. Jesus, mercy, mercy upon me. Okay. And you just can, mm. it's, mm, it's beautiful. There are different ways. You, if you're musical, if you're in yeah. a kind of thing, it's another way to kind of touch yeah. into it. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. Yes, and that's true. Any, anything that you want to bring to it, you know, if you want to chant it or sing it or make it longer, or um, it, it's, it's a wonderful prayer that can take in all of that. So. Um, could, I, could I speak? Is, is it yeah, working? Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> Janie's question about, it also, you think of, was it St. John of the Cross, who of course said, die before you die, but who said, we have the dark night of the soul, mm -hmm. and that's a regular spiritual um, uh, rhythm, the cycle of contraction and expansion. So one just has to, that happens in one's life, the whole thing is that way. So I think your idea of, of, of just wading through it is beautiful. And you were speaking about the uh, way of the pilgrim, I teach world religions, and if there's one book I could assign only, it would be this book. Because that little pilgrim's trust in his humility and his poverty, he simply, you know, he, he had read, St. Paul said, our heart has to pray, cease, pray, pray ceaselessly. And he started wandering around Russia with a little knapsack and a crust of bread, and he finally found a staretz, a spiritual master. Staretz is uh, the Russian word for elder. Uh, Jeron is the Greek. Sheikh is the Arabic. Each tradition, it's the elder. And he met the el and he, and he wanted more than anything to have a copy of the Philokalia. And these are the writings of the early church fathers, which he finally has. But what struck me about him was he would wander along and suddenly a family would take him in for the night just at the moment where he needed that help. And he was so grateful. Someone would give him a crust of bread. And that humility and trust is amazing. I first uh, read Franny and Zooey in the New Yorker magazine when I was young. And when I teach uh, hesychasm, I read the story of Franny and Zooey. And then we do the way of the pilgrim. And then we read from the Philokalia, which people like Bishop Ware and all of the rest of them have been working on for years. And just uh, another reflection is that um, I was at Oxford under Bishop Callistus Ware studying. My first degree was in the, in the Jesus Prayer. And Rowan Williams, who has been the Archbishop of Canterbury and will be here um, in June for the Merton Centenary, 
is the one who got me to Bishop Callistus. And one day I said to Rowan, I said to Rowan, do you do the Jesus prayer? I mean, you're an Anglican. He said, yes, you can do it. And he said, just to say that, um, you, you know, you never know the effect it's having on you. He said, you know, I'm an asthmatic. And sometimes in the night, my asthma wakes me. And I have discovered that my prayer is saying the heart ceaselessly. So that's who Rowan really is, that. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that being that you find in your heart is your true self. That, that's your, and, and the whole point of the prayer. There's a wonderful book by John Main. Um, I, I, I don't know what I did with it. I think, I thought I had it here, um, where he talks about that, that the, the whole point of this prayer is this unification, bringing all these disparate part of ourselves, the mind and the heart together, and to finding the true self in there and the peace that comes with that. So how, how are we doing for, for time? We're, we're, we're five minutes more. Five minutes more, okay. okay. Go ahead. Oh, good. Yes, good morning and thank you, first of all, for this lovely uh, talk. I have two questions I'd like to ask. Uh, first, would you please uh, say a little bit more about what um, attracted you to, what you noticed about the Sufis, um, <laughs> that you said something about their prayer was doing something that your, uh, your version of prayer was not. I wonder if you'd elaborate a little bit, please, on that. And the second question is, this is, uh, you do mention uh, prayer in, praying ceaselessly. I'd like to ask you in, your, in this practice, while you're practicing, do you uh, keep the prayer going by, uh, through effort, so to speak? Or uh, is there a point in which you allow the, the, pr the prayer to dissolve, perhaps? Thank you. Dur during the prayer time or through the rest of the day? I suppose either one, either the 20 minutes that you mentioned twice yeah. a day during that time. Well, and let me take that one day. first. Um, I, obviously, you have to stop. You know, you have to do other things, and you can't, you can't keep that going. Um, I think the prayer can be unspoken in your heart and just be with you. Uh, you, can, you can bring it back at any time during the day. You, you can have, call upon that verbally and start the, the, the words again at any time during the day. But I, I have to get up and do other things. I have to earn a living and, you know, so, so that the prayer isn't verbally going in my mind. Um, but I, I would hope it's in my heart. I mean, it's, it's in my heart during the day as well. And at any time when you bring it back. Does, does that answer enough? What, um, I was 25 when we went to Cairo. And I was just struck by what a spiritual country it was. Um, everybody. I mean, it was much more religious than America was at the time. I was struck by people saying, Inshallah, and you know, just keeping on thinking, not yes, this is going to happen, but if God allows, it will happen. Just always this making room, God still was part of their lives in a way that didn't seem to be much in our, in our country. And when I saw people doing this prayer, it was, what I saw too was that they were doing it as a group, so that the chanting of Allah was um, people together. Um, but it was just this, the idea of repeating the name of God in a way that seemed to bring something into their lives. I, I don't know if I could put it into words. I, I just thought, this is a dimension of prayer that I had not, I, I, you know, I went to church, I was raised a Christian, but I, I had not had the idea that I would live a life, that, that my own life would be so affected by, by a prayer and by a, um, doing something like that. People seemed very uh, more humble and, and very spiritual there too. Um, I just think it's a country, I have been. I was back a few years ago, but this was a good 40, 45 years ago. Um, but it, it, it's a country where I just felt the people were very beautiful. They really, they really had a, a, a spirituality that they lived. Um, and, when, when something is meant for you in, in this life, I think you are attracted to it. 
for whatever reason. I mean, you know, I, I just knew that was for me. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how. I just, I, I heard that. I knew I did not want to become a Muslim. I wanted to stay a Christian. So my task was to figure out how to do that. And that's what led me. They all said to me, well, then you need to find the Jesus prayer. You need to find a traditional religion and find a traditional form of it. Thank you for this intimate conversation. I, too, was reminded of John of the Cross, which surprises me. I would never have thought of myself quoting him until I studied uh, Mark Foley's The Ascent of Mount Carmel with my meditation group. And when he talks about consolation and withdrawal, uh, I was reminded of that by that early question. Um, and that, we, that we're guided to be detached, as you said, from those feelings and not be focused on the result. And if our, our, our faith is that the Holy Presence is consistent, whether we feel it or not, right. and if right. we're faithful to our practice, then we can trust that, the presence yeah. and the practice, and that is enough. Yeah, that's right. That's, it's that trust in the face of your kind of annihilation, you keep trusting. Um, and that, that is, on a larger scale, what I learned about my life in general. No matter what was happening to you know, death in my family and everything else, it was the trust that is, that is the most important thing of all. Um, and, and that has nothing to do with circumstances, that you just keep that, keep trusting. <laughs>